No, but I told my classmates that.
your life. No. They can hear that. Um we could try that out. I think I have five right now. You'd have to have LED. You'd have to have like real candles. No, you'd have to have like an LED, like a white, not a decorative one kind of. Hi, everyone. We appreciate all of you who have joined in early. Um, we are about 10 minutes away from getting started, so just wanted to um, say hello, and we'll be getting started in about 10 minutes.
to have. Hi, everyone. This is Ariana from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're five minutes away from starting. Um, you may have noticed that we've muted everyone on entry just to make sure that there is low interference. So um, we will take questions at the end and we'll get started in about five minutes. So thanks again for all of you who are joining early. All right, good morning to everyone who is on the line today. Um, it may be afternoon your time, so welcome. Uh, this is our webinar. Um, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is presenting Getting to Zero Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infections. And we have uh, some wonderful speakers today from two organizations. Uh, so I would like to get started. I'm sure by the time I get to the next slide, it'll be nine o'clock Pacific time. Um, so as we talk through our agenda for the day, I will start out introducing you all to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and our actionable patient safety solutions, which we call our app. Um, I will be brief because we do have two sets of speakers today. Um, so we're planning about 40 minutes of expert presentation. And then we'll leave 
10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So to get started, um, we are the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and our goal is to eliminate preventable deaths in hospitals by the year 2020. We often call that zero by 2020, and that's what you see on the screen now. And we focus on the very bold and audacious goal of zero because we truly believe that one preventable patient death is one too many, especially when we have initiatives and protocols for understanding the problems and presenting solutions. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, again, is fostering new efforts by building on to existing patient safety programs through commitments to zero. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation was started in 2012. We had our first meeting in 2013, and we were founded by Joe Kiani. He's also a well-known entrepreneur and engineer who started the medical device company called Massimo. And it was at that time that the Institute of Medicine uh, created the report to Air is Human. And at that time, the estimate was that between 44 and 98,000 Americans were dying preventably. This obviously caused a lot of people to start focusing on patient safety, and for that, we're really glad. It took us uh, until 2012 to really start honing in on it and, and launching the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and that was mainly because in 2010, the Office of the Inspector General produced a report that said that about 182,000 beneficiaries of Medicaid and Medicare uh, were being adversely affected in hospitals. And so between that 1999 and 2010, um, that estimate of preventable deaths in the hospital spiked from about 98,000 to about 182,000 just for that population within CMS. And so at that time, Joe started thinking, you know, it's been a decade since that initial report. What can I do um, in order to bring together the healthcare ecosystem? And so we determined that the best way to do that was to take action and create opportunities for organization to participate in the patient safety movement to get closer to zero preventable deaths by 2020. So the first group that we work with are hospitals and healthcare organizations. We encourage them to make public commitments around how they're improving patient safety within their institution. This can be an existing program that they're really proud of and have been successful reducing instances of harm and death. It can also be an opportunity for goal setting. In a lot of uh, developing countries that we receive commitments from, they use our platform as a way to share what they plan on doing and learning from those organizations who have committed through our foundation. At this time, we have 4,598 hospitals and healthcare organizations across 44 countries who are participating. The second group are partners. Um, we ask them to sign commitment to action letters these can be organizations like associations, professional societies, advocacy groups, and other nonprofits who are helping to push the same message forward, patient safety. And so we come up with customized ways that partners can work with us, um, and we post those publicly on our website as well. At this time, we have about 55. The third group that we work with, which makes us very unique, is working with healthcare technology companies. We ask them to sign a letter, it's a pledge, we call it our open data pledge, and we encourage healthcare technology companies that are producing patient data through the devices and products that, that um, hospitals purchase, um, or systems that are interconnecting those like electronic health record companies, to sign a pledge that says that they will not knowingly interfere or charge for data sharing in order to improve patient safety. To date, we have over 83 companies who've signed that open data pledge, and we're really proud that we're making progress to get more um, types of healthcare technology companies to join us. The fourth group that we work with are patients and family members. We not only encourage people in the public um, space to share their stories with us, instances of harm that they may have survived or family members survived, or potentially the tragic cases of those people who lost their lives due to a preventable medical error. We also encourage and, and ask um, actively for patient and family perspectives in every area that the Patient Safety Movement Foundation works, including our board levels, the work groups that we have around the actionable patient safety solutions that were gathered here around today, um, and, and really helping us identify resources that could be helpful to other patients and family members. So 
With that, I'm going to focus real briefly on our actionable patient safety solutions. So these are the 16 evidence-based best practice documents that we've put together over the last six years. And as you can see, there's some small print on the right-hand side. I hope you can read it. Um, but we have 16 overarching challenges, which are healthcare-associated infections, medications, neonatal safety, obstetric safety, embolic events, just to name a few of those. And then if you see underneath, there are sub-apps, as we call them, where, for instance, today, we're focusing on 2S, our central line associated bloodstream infections. So kind of a subtopic over the overarching healthcare associated infections. So these solutions are um, not yet in mobile form. They are PDFs that you can download and encourage your leadership to look at. If you are in a leadership position, we encourage you to download these freely off of our website and use the executive summary checklist, which is the first page of each document, to really determine if your organization is positioned to get close to and hover around zero for any of these topics. So with that, I um, will just share briefly, I, I mentioned this before, the number of hospitals that we have committed um, to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Again, those are the groups that are the hospitals that are sharing publicly what initiatives they're working on and how they have a plan to achieve zero. We have 4,598 across 44 countries, which has grown steadily since um, our inception in 2013. What I wanted to focus on is that these hospitals, by sharing how they're improving safety, can help others emulate their successes. Just those 4,598 hospitals in our network, they claimed over 81,533 lives were saved in 2017 alone. This was reported in, in um, February earlier this year. And this shows that by putting in place processes, we truly can save lives together. So with that, I hope that was a helpful introduction to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation if you are just learning about us for the first time. Um, I am now pleased to pass over to the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. We have two distinguished speakers, Sarah Burton and Rebecca Bell, who will lead us through um, their set of slides around getting to zero. And then um, we will also have um, Susan Azarian from Tri-City Medical Center follow shortly after with their perspective. So Sarah and uh, Rebecca, you can take us away. Thanks, and thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Becca Bell. I work in the pediatric ICU um, at the University of Vermont Medical Center. I'm with Sarah Burton, who's our neonatal uh, nurse educator. Um, and the University of Vermont Medical Center is located in Burlington, Vermont. Um, we are near Lake Champlain and sort of are near the border of New York. So we take care of patients both from Vermont and from northern New York. Um, and we are the major academic medical center. We have the College of Medicine here, as well as the College of Nursing. Uh, next slide. For our pediatric patients, um, we are a children's hospital within a hospital. Um, our, we have a general pediatric floor, um, which includes our neonatal transitional unit um, as well. We have a neonatal intensive care unit, and then a pediatric um, intensive care unit, which um, is a little bit of a, a unique model. We share space with a surgical ICU um, group with nurses trained in both, and so we have the flexibility to go up to 15 beds if needed, needed although our average census is more like, uh, closer to five or six. Next slide. So um, we have looked as a children's hospital um, at many different hospital-acquired uh, conditions or infections, and. Um, this is a, a chart of our, um, our CLABSIs. And as we um, were having an increased incidence of CLABSIs, um, in 2015, um, we decided as, as a department that we really needed to take a look at this, so formed a team there. And since that time, um, we've had two periods where we've had no um, CLABSIs. Next slide. Hi, this is Sarah Burton now. Um, so we, at around that time, uh, we have um, a wonderful woman named Kathy Brown. She's our quality program coordinator for the Vermont Children's Hospital, and she reached out to us and said, what can we do? And we uh, joined forces with people around the hospital 
to form a committee on focusing on collapse prevention. And what we really wanted to do is get representatives from all key pediatric areas. We really wanted to try to get different roles involved, but make it very interdisciplinary, and include those that we that may not be so obvious. Um, we have people from had the IV team, quality nursing and uh, provider reps, uh, bedside nursing, as well as educators from the different pediatric units. And we also had a family advisor join forces with us for a little while. And just calling on others as needed, such as our EPIC team, to help with some of making some improvements with our electronic health record system. Next slide. <clears throat> So we determined at that point that it would be a good direction for us to take by joining forces with the solutions for patient safety. And much like the patient safety movement, this is geared toward children's hospitals specifically. And it's a network of 130 plus children's hospitals that share the goal to urgently reduce and then eliminate serious harm for children being cared for in our facilities. So they really take an all teach, all learn collaboration I really see a lot of similarities between this group and the patient safety movement. Um, they help provide benchmark data, uh, give guidelines on best practice. They have many QI audit tools. There are webinars, and there's great uh, ability to network on their website with other units, both on a regional level as well as a national level, and they do conferences as well. Next slide. So we're not going to go into great detail, but we have a couple, the next couple slides show the prevention bundles that they have specifically on CLABSIs because they do have different ones for different hospital acquired conditions. Um, but this is the insertion bundle for CLABSI prevention. And then there's another, um, another one for maintenance, which is on the next slide. <clears throat> and then Becca is going to talk more about the auditing process. Thanks. Next slide, please. So we um, split our team up into um, those who would look at insertion um, and those who would look at maintenance in terms of preventing collapses. Um, so for the insertion piece, the first thing we did was look at the SPS best practices, and then we looked at our own documentation in our EHR to make sure that, um, that those um, were the same, and they were. Mm -hmm. um, and so then our next step was to actually audit all of the central line insertions among pediatric patients in the hospital, regardless of where they were placed, so whether it was the ER, the PICU, the NICU, um, the operating room, interventional radiology, um, and we made sure that every um, central line insertion was associated with um, documentation of the best practices. Um, we did identify um, in the NICU, the, the nurse practitioners who are placing the lines had their own note template that didn't include all of these practices, so we did do some education with that group. So then they um, began to use the central line navigator in our EHR. Um, then the next piece was looking at maintenance. Um, and so we had um, nurse champions on each um, unit uh, do some sort of random auditing, looking at dressings, um, looking at dr the dressing change process. Um, and that was really helpful for us to just get a sense of what things we were following and what things um, folks were having trouble with so that we can make a plan for intervention. Um, we noted that dating of the dressing was an issue, so there was some education around that. And then we felt in general that dressing changes um, deserve more attention and, and work together to make an educational tool, which Sarah will, will talk more about. Uh, next slide. And then we also wanted to look at what we were doing well. So, you know, one of the big pushes is to make sure that um, any provider put, placing a central line is, is, is really proficient, and this is something that we do well in the pediatrics department. So we feel strongly that, um, that the most senior you know, um, provider place a central line, and we have a core group of people doing that. So um, we feel that any trainees that need to place central lines because they're going into a field, um, because they're going to a field where they'll need to do that, um, 
um, then they would learn that in their fellowship. Um, but otherwise, residents um, and certainly medical students um, don't need to place central lines. And so in the PICU, we just have PICU attendings placing central lines. In the NICU, it's just the NNPs and the PAs, and, and that way they're doing many lines and have been become really proficient in that. Um, as far as maintenance, um, the NICU has a, group, a core group of experienced nurses that do the line changes. Um, and then we had been in all the units doing a pretty good job of assessing and documenting need for a line and, and when the line can be removed. Um, the other piece that was a little bit unique was that we have a built-in system in our, our EHR for the NICU patients where once they reach full feeds, there's a prompt that um, reminds the, the person um, to consider removal of the line if it's not needed anymore. And then we felt that our our group was a pretty motivated group and we met pretty frequently and that helped us kind of move things along and implement changes. And then we also credited um, just our hospital-wide culture of safety in, in making some of these changes. Sarah's gonna talk about the educational tool that we implemented. Next slide. Uh, so around the same time that we were working on all of this, one of our nurses was in his master's program and he joined forces with us to create a Powtoon video that we could use for education and roll out to our staff on, you know, kind of emphasizing these key points of the bundle. And so this is just a picture of the, we didn't want to show the whole video, but this gives you a sense of what was in the video going through all of the steps. And then you can see in the next slide. <clears throat> It was just a fun way to uh, capture people's attention. And then we also included this with our annual nursing competency process on how to, you know, improve our workings with central line. Next slide. Um, then we thought we would just cover some things that were kind of unique that we implemented in the NICU. And one thing was that we purchased procedure cards that were meant specifically for doing line changes. I think one thing that is a challenge for us and, and probably in other NICUs is that currently we're an open day model until we move to our new unit and space is always an issue for us. So there's not always space at the bedside to have a nice clean, clutter-free place to do line changes and so these carts can be moved around the unit and they have an IV pole and the drawers have all the supplies needed to do their line changes. <clears throat> we also started using Kuros caps as a standard for all of our lines whenever they were capped off. And then we also have a disinfection unit which uses UV light and that is right by the um, entrance where staff and family can put their phones in and clean while they're washing their hands because we know that they're going to be using their phones to take pictures and things like that in the unit. <clears throat> we also have these sterile procedure signs that we can mount by the bedside when they're doing a line insertion and that just helps raise awareness that this is going on and to give the space needed to do that. Next slide. So we felt that um, one way to get, to promote awareness and, and buy-in from all staff members, um, because everyone plays a part in, in um, CLABSI prevention, was to celebrate our successes. And so when we had those two periods where we had zero pediatric CLABSIs, um, we celebrated. So. Um, each unit had um, a lunch or a dinner, depending on whether it was day or night shift. Um, we had signs up. Um, we presented some of our work at quality forums. And this was just a really nice way for everyone to, to be aware of the work that we're doing and um, the need to work hard every day to, to prevent collapses. Next slide. And then we're continuing to find new ways um, to maintain uh, low collapse rates and, and to con continue with our success. So we felt as a group that the, the auditing piece was, was difficult and we're trying to find a better way to formalize this, um, which Sarah will talk about in a bit. Um, 
we do partner with a um, company that makes BioPatch, and they do quarterly audits um, at our hospital um, among our pediatric patients, but also adult patients. And then they give a report to the, our CLABC hospital-wide committee on um, what issues we've been having, um, any failures, and then what what specific units might be having trouble with. And that's a way to get pretty good uh, real-time feedback, and then representatives from the units can go back to their units and, and, and give those results and, and work on improvement. Um, the central line insertion piece, um, we've decided as a hospital that um, any provider placing a central line really needs to show competency, not just in the technique of placing the line, but in, in the sterile aspects um, related to that. And so we're using, we partnered with our simulation center, um, and every provider is going to, going to need to go through a course where they show competency, and then before placing the line, we'll um, show the bedside nurse that they, they've completed this competency. As I mentioned, we in the pediatrics department, we don't have residence placing lines, but in the um, in our hospital, the, certainly some of the adult specialties, the um, residents are placing lines. So they're going to start with the trainees um, going through the simulation and then um, move up to all the attendings who are placing lines. And then for the maintenance piece, um, you know, the dressing change was really an area that we felt could we could could use a little bit more work. And so um, some of our nursing leaders have looked into improving the kit, the sterile kit used for dressing change, um, identifying the fact that sometimes some pieces were missing and we were having to pull out different pieces. And so they are piloting um, a few different types of sterile maintenance kits, and we're going to use those on the units and get some feedback and, and move forward with getting those new kits. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so, uh, we actually learned about this through SPS, and it's, um, we call them K cards, but it's Kamishibai cards. And what it is is a visual audit tool, and it's meant to be peer to peer. And then going, you can use it for different hospital acquired conditions and use like a rack card holder as a way to display your results. So, one side of the card is green and the other side can be red or orange, meaning that you did not meet all the elements of the bundle. <clears throat> and essentially, you can take, pick a couple staff for each shift and then say, okay, I'd like you to go around and audit on this particular um, hospital-acquired uh -huh. condition, so CLABSI, for example. And then they look at all the elements of the bundle with the nurse who's caring for that patient, and then it's a way to make sure they're following all the elements and make corrections on the spot and also help identify reasons for when elements are not there and identifying what are the system's issues or what can we do better and make this, you know, make improvements. It's also a way that could potentially engage patients and families. So if they're there, they can also help by get involved and make sure that the nurses and themselves are following these elements to keep their child safe. So we know that, you know, getting to zero is a journey. It's not a straight line. There's always room for improvements, and this is a way that we can try to continue to get the momentum to go forward um, by using KCAR. That's it from us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we really appreciate your perspective from your facility up in Vermont. Um, so with that, I'd like to pass it on to Susan to carry us on. All right, thank you. Well, welcome, and thank you for joining the webinar this morning. I am Susan Zarian. I know it says Annette Reed Lilly as well on our slide, but she is ill today, so you are stuck with me. But I'm a staff nurse and also have a major role in the NICU at Tri-City as the PIC team coordinator. I formulated the Beyond the Bundle plan for cloud safe prevention over eight years ago, and since then we have had a zero rate in pick line infections. Hopefully some of this information will be of use to you, and I'm happy to share it today. Tri-City, just for a background, is an acute care hospital located in Oceanside, California, which is in northern San Diego County. We're a community hospital and have a level three NICU, with, which has 20 licensed beds. 
We accommodate about 500 internal admissions and 100 external admissions each year. Moving on. Moving on, sorry, okay. This graph is PAPSI data prior to the NICU developing our own central line team. And the takeaway is that our numbers really varied greatly because we didn't have a consistent methodology for addressing all lines all the time. You can see in 2008, our CLAPSI rate was 9% per 1,000 central line days, and it dropped to zero in 2009 and back up to 2010 at 2.3 uh, per central line, 1,000 central line days. But we attribute our success to the combined intervention of a CLABSI prevention bundle and really a dedicated central line team, which we refer to as our beyond the bundle implementation. The process was developed in two, late 2010 and we implemented it in 2011. Moving on, there you go. Prior to 2007, our central lines were placed and guided at physician discretion. The neonatologist decided which patients qualified for central lines they educated families, and they determined when the lines would be discontinued. The NICU initially started training nurses to place picks mostly for the doctors to be more flexible in their other duties in labor and delivery. So training of the pick nurses was really in response to interruptions in the NICU patient care flow when they'd get a call from L&D to go to delivery, and not about PLATSI prevention in the early years between about 2007 and 2010. There were some bundle elements in place, but they were not strictly enforced. And we ran into the problem of who do you hold accountable if a central line stays in too many days? Or how can the physicians monitor how a central line tubing change was performed or how a medication was attached because they really weren't at the bedside? We noticed a major disconnect, but weren't exactly sure how to fix the issue at the time. And it wasn't until August 23, 2010, when an X26 Six weeker named Isaiah had umbilical line contracted a central line infection. The NICU nurses had grown very close to Isaiah and he, we knew his family intimately, so we really took it to heart. And that was a wake up call for all of us. That was the moment that we knew we had to change the culture in the NICU with regard to central line care and infection prevention. Moving on. So we knew we had to own the entire process. This decision was made to take over the entire CLAPSI process because one CLAPSI is too many. And the cost, which is not just financial, is too great. The RNs who were trained already band together to control this process. We most closely followed NAN guidelines, and that's the National Association of Neonatal Nurses, um, and their bundle elements. At the start of this endeavor, we did an evidence-based literature review, which revealed that utilizing a team approach was most effective in reducing CLABC rates. So in 2010, our RN-based PIC team became fully formed. Introduction of this dedicated nurse-based CLABC team has been successful in our NICU and is probably the single most important change to keeping our CLABC rate at zero for PIC lines for more than eight years. Our founding principle is one CLABC is too many. We all know CLABSIs affect many individuals on many levels. The baby has to endure increased pain and suffering, antibiotic therapy, probable increased length of stay. The family may endure increased anxiety, issues with bonding, and a greater financial burden. While the NICU staff is also negatively impacted, moral, morale and workload can be affected. And the hospital may be affected by increased financial burden, mandatory reporting to healthcare agencies, and more. Our NICU is proud of our accomplishments to date and are working diligently to keep zero going. Moving on. So when we first got together in 2010, our RN based PIC team fully formed and focused our prevention processes on these four areas, education, insertion, maintenance, and removal. And we wanted to look at the details of every single one of these to see what we could do and how to form our process. So first we'll look at education, moving on. The first focus is education. We had to develop an entire educational process basically from scratch. Education includes initial training and ongoing competencies for PIC team members. We ensure competent proctoring and expect each PIC nurse to maintain quarterly minimum for successful insertions. Biannually, or every two years, PIC team members go through an eight hour course that contains 
both didactic and hands-on elements. Recently, we found that we had a need for training of a subset of nurses to act as mentors for the night shift because our PICS team members on nights kept taking day shift positions. So, and there's a lot of new staff on night shift. Because of this need, we developed a central line super user designation and new course to correspond. These super users are given a more in-depth, hands-on course and education on bundle elements and is seen as the super users and expertise um, in that night shift. All staff have had didactic training courses as well as annual competencies, and they vary. Sometimes we do dressing changes, tubing, tubing changes, um, line discontinuation, et cetera. We also look at um, education of ancillary staff and family education. We did develop new educational handouts in English and Spanish for our parents um, because Spanish is the main secondary language of our patient population. Moving on. Next, we looked at prevention from the insertion viewpoint. We asked ourselves, so what can we do regarding insertion to decrease our CLAPC rate? First, we decided that all procedures needed to be two-person to increase awareness of breaks in any sterile procedure. We changed the culture at Tri-City so the bedside nurse will advocate for central lines for their patients in need during rounds. Most babies requiring seven or more days of either hyperalimentation or medication is deemed a candidate at Tri-City. And the bedside nurse is empowered to advocate for that line. So this is no longer physician driven, it's really collaborative. Insertion checklists needed to be developed and we use NAN as our guideline as a resource for this checklist. We use timeout posters as a reminder um, to do the timeout prior to the procedure. And we really empower all staff to stop if there's a break in sterile procedure. We have big stop signs around the unit as well as timeout um, posters as well. Then we looked at product utilization, designed our own PIC insertion kit. We have had success with the BD introducer, but have had changed catheter several times due to increases in phlebitis or other complications. Um, and we redesigned our clip form, which is in Cerner, our electronic record. Um, the clip is a central line insertion practice adherence monitoring, monitoring tool for California. And this enabled us to have better data to monitor compliance, complications, and collapse rates. Moving on to maintenance. We then looked at how we can maintain these lines to reduce the risk of infection. Maintenance encompassed the entire staff focusing on how to ensure the sterility of the fluid, the medication administration, tubing changes, as well as appropriate dressing changes. As mentioned before, all staff were required to attend educational classes, which focus on appropriate osmolarity and pH of maintenance fluids and medications, site and dressing assessment, and proper sterile technique for all tubing and syringe changes. We also had nurses perform competencies in proper sterile dressing techniques using a customized dressing change kit. We instituted a daily bedside checklist, which I will show you later, which empowers the bedside nurse to be responsible for the line maintenance bundle elements each shift. So pick our N and a super user or, and the bedside nurse are assigned every shift to oversee that every um, line is assessed via this bedside checklist. Moving on. And lastly, we took a look at the removal and what challenges that held for our CLAPC rate. Of course, it's important to assess for line necessity and you can't minimize the importance of getting that line out as soon as possible. I want everyone to think about it. I want the doctor to think about it, the nurse to ponder it, and the family to ask about it. Does the baby still need a line? Can an NG suffice for feeding? Are we close enough to full feedings and fortification? Or when is antibiotic therapy complete? All these questions must be asked every single day, and the assessment of line necessity needs to be put into our medical record. When we remove the lines, we do it as a sterile procedure, which was different than um, pre-2010, including a hat, mask, and sterile gloves. Um, and staff need to understand that the sterile removal is important because sometimes the line doesn't come out on the first try, 
and then we need to redress it with a sterile dressing so you're not trapping bacteria in there. We usually then warm the extremity and try again at a later time. Moving on. So many in institutions and websites identify a different CLABC bundle elements. The most basic five are these above, hand hygiene, maximum barrier precaution for insertion, chlorhexidine skin antisepsis, optimal catheter site selection, and daily review line necessities. And this, these come from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, but like I said, there are a lot of entities, NAN, the CDC, Joint Commission, et cetera, that have groupings of bundles. Moving on. But well, we knew that we had to apply and successfully integrate the recommended bundle elements, but we also were determined to go directly to a zero plasty rate. And knowing that, we decided to implement even further strategies that I'll share with you today. And we nicknamed this grouping beyond the bundle. This included several items outlined here, but of note is a daily bedside checklist. The baby's nurse and pick nurse formally look at the site, the dressing, the tubing chain sticker, medication port, any add-on devices, the heparin amount and the fluid, the dexterous amount, and then the physician assessment of line necessity and complete that checklist together on every single shift, every single day until that line comes out. Worthy of mentioning is that this checklist is not perfect. It has been modified three or four times, four times because we continually reassess what we need to look at, what is working, and where we may be falling short in our audits. So the list though gives us the flexibility to revamp the process and it's really the bedside checklist is super crucial to us. We also developed bedside placards, excuse me, which provided visual for all staff, family, and visitors that the patient has a central line. They are just hanging, placards I'll show you a picture of in a moment, they just hang on the IV pole. So for instance, if our occupational therapist comes over to assess a baby, work on feedings, they notice the placard and they know to ask the bedside nurse for assistance prior to swaddling or lifting or moving the baby with a central line. We have added also different annual competencies for nursing staff uh, whenever the need arises. Last year, we required everyone do a return demonstration on discontinuing a central line using sterile technique. The year prior, we had checked off each nurse on dressing changes. And I know before that, we had done tubing changes as well. Moving on. So this slide is probably my favorite tool. It's a picture of our bedside checklist. I hope you can see it well enough. It's a two person check again, twice per day, one on each shift. And the form can easily be customized to enable auditing of your best practice criterion. For instance, if your unit has fallen short in audits on labeling dressing, then a line item can, can be added to the checklist to address that particular issue. Um, we have had um, problems with stickers, the appropriate sticker being on the add-on devices. And so we added, added an item. And one thing that is really important on this, we don't leave it so that it's just checked off. We actually make them write in words so that people don't get in the habit of just check, 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 check all the way down. Um, like we'll ask, the first one says the flu is infusing. So you have to write in D10 hyperal or D5 or whatever it is, the heparin amount, you're going to write either 0.5 or one unit. So we don't just let them check in. They actually have to think through and do it, um, like I said, with a, either a super user or a pick nurse. Moving on. This is a photo of our bedside placards. As I said, they hang on the IV pole and give a general visual to all that the patient has a central line. We also included important reminders on various cards. You can see there's a stack of, I guess, like four cards there. We have reminders of when dressing should be changed, reminders to use an auto uh, microclave on all the medication lines and things like that. This placard is particularly for picks, but we also have a central line placard for umbilical lines. And moving on, 
Then this is one of the cards behind that main one. It's a reminder card. And initially, uh, RNs were ask, asking us for a reminder of when sterile gloves need to be used versus exam gloves because this whole process was new to all of us in 2011. So when removing an old dressing, we use just exam gloves. But if you're applying a new dressing, sterile gloves need to be utilized. So the bedside placard is easy to produce. We laminate them, put them on the bedside, and they can be modified based on every unit's specific needs. Moving on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then this graph displays our plastic rate prior to and after our Beyond the Bundle implementation. It includes all PIC and umbilical lines. Since introduction of our nurse based PIC team, the PIC line infections have remained zero since 2010, while we had one umbilical line infection in 2017, accounting for a 0.1% per 1,000 line day rate. Uh, you can see 2017 bumps up a little bit. But we were all over the place prior to 2011 and have been very successful and um, um, with our commitment to Beyond the Bundle. Moving on. <clears throat> so, is there room for improvement? Um, one important theme throughout our eight-year venture is the need to be flexible and adapt the very best practice for the overall patient population. Moving on. So, the answer to is there room for improvement is absolutely yes. There's always room for improvement. You'll need to identify challenges and then realistic, achievable solutions, which is probably um, the hardest part of this whole venture. Each facility has their own difficulties, I know that. One challenge, us, challenge for us is really our new hires. We have to show them that the culture that we've developed, that we're diligent in all matters related to line insertion, maintenance, and removal, and our expectations of them during the orientation have to reflect that culture. Parent education may be challenging. There's different languages, educational levels, vis visitation schedules. So processes with regard to dressings or tubing changes may have flaws. And whatever it is, don't be afraid to just continuously reevaluate your processes and your checklist and update them to make them more successful. Lastly, your team must keep up to date with the latest research and incorporate that information into practice. Moving on. Uh, oh, do we not have the photo? I had a photo of our pig team. There we go. <laughs> this is the latest photo of our pig team. And we want to acknowledge that our success to date is due to our entire team and also all the physician support, the NICU staff support, and NICU management. On the next page are some references. And finally, we'd like to thank Claire and Ariana of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for putting this webinar together and inviting me to speak today. I appreciate it, ladies. Thank you so much, Susan, Becca, Sarah. Um, we really appreciate your perspectives um, being out there in the field. We wanted to pick a West Coast spot and an East Coast spot um, in order to encourage everyone out there who's on the line um, to obviously see what work is being done out there. And I really love the focus on continual improvement because, you know, while zero is the goal, there, there may be changes and unintended consequences of new technology and new people and new ideas that um, we'll always have to keep up on. So we really appreciate the expertise from you three lovely ladies today. And with that, we have plenty of time for questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Claire to see if there's been any questions that have come through on the chat. Okay, um, so if you all um, who are out there listening would like to chat on the web version, um, please feel free. We are going to attempt to unmute everyone, but we may have to very quickly mute again just because there may be interference. So. Just bear with us a second to see how much interference there may, there may be when we um, unmute. I just want to remember there's two numbers. Seven, six, five, two, five, seven, eight, oh, two. 
because uh, it was, uh, we've gotten so much education out in Hi these there. places to not do name changes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to um, um, that, Okay, so I think you know, we may be able to do it. Start looking. They're all Okay, so that didn't quite work. You, I think you heard a lot of um, interference. What we're going to try to do is um, unmute people that we can see aren't interfering, if possible. Um, we do have someone who just chatted in on the web. And um, Laura Buford asks, would she be willing to share her checklist? So I'm assuming that's for Susan. Um, I yeah, I don't know if you want to give them my email or if you guys want to interface and get emails from people and I can do that easily. Okay. Yeah. If you're willing to do that, what we can do is we'll send out an email to everyone following this with where they can find the presentation afterwards. So if we want to just include a link to your checklist, we can do that. Okay. We also, if people are interested, have all the checklists for all our competencies as well. We have a dressing change competency, we have an insertion competency, and a tubing uh, line change competency if they want those. Great. Okay, that person said thanks. <laughs> okay. You want to go ahead? Um, another question came through, and it's uh, can either or both facility talk about what is in their dressing change kit? And that's from Stephanie Wardowski. Uh, I can. I wish I had one in front of me, but it's basically everything except the sterile gloves. We have sterile drape. We have suture um, remover to help. We have core prep. We have gauze and um, new tegaderm is what we use to put over it. Um, Steri strip. Just everything we need is in one pack, as well as, um, sorry, uh, sterile um, Sally White. Everything we need is in one place, and we just made them ourselves um, through our distribution center downstairs. So. Okay. Um, Sarah or Becca, did you want to add anything around your kit? Sure, we have something sort of similar, um, but it doesn't include the gloves. Um, it includes the, the chloroprep, um, then you take a derm, some gauze, um, uh, some suture remover, removal, and, um, but, but what we're trying to do, I sort of mentioned, is get a package that actually has, um, includes those things plus the gloves, plus the drape, and, and the way that you actually open up the kit um, is sort of piece by piece. So you open up the first part and you put the gloves on, and then there are also um, visual instructions on how to do that, um, and then with a bio patch as well. So the, um, we're piloting those products. I think one is from, from Medline, um, but we're, we're trying a, a few different types. Great. Um, I have another question from Dee Santos to uh, Sarah and Becca, and it's how long is your POW tune and did you require staff to complete? Hi. Yes. Uh, I believe it's a couple minutes long and, yeah, like three minutes. And, we yes, we did require all of our nurses to watch that. Great. It's and on then, YouTube. <laughs> We could probably share oh, cool. the link, too. Oh, that would be great. We can include that. Mm -hmm. And we have another question from Kathleen Volman, and it's, what are you doing for bathing patients less than two months greater old than. or greater than two months old with a central line pick of CVC? I think pick or CVC. Okay. Great. Just a typo. Got it. Oh, I don't know who you're asking. Um, what we do is we do swaddle bathing, but we just use that one, leave the arm or the leg or whatever extremity out of the tub and do the same, um, just pH neutral soap and bath, and we let the parents do it, but the nurse is there watching and ensuring that the line is safe and dry. Any perspective from UVM? No, we do the same. Great, great. 
Another follow-up question from Kathleen Volman is, are you using the pocket technology for the dressing kit? I do not know what that is. What did she say, pocket te technology? Yeah, pocket technology. I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, I think that's what – sorry, this is Becca from UVM. I think that's what I was referring to. So so the um, – I'm using my hands, but no one can see this. But it is, it is sort of this <laughs> folded pocket kit where, that's sterile. So you open it up, and you open the first pocket. And in that pocket, there are gloves with a picture. And then you put those on, and you open the next pocket. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, the, um, that's exactly what we're piloting right now. And it seems like a really good product. We've all taken a look at it. Great. Great. We don't have any questions at this time. So if anyone wants to write in, feel free. In the meantime, what I'll do um, as we wait is I do have one other slide that I wanted to show just promoting and um, making everyone aware of some other events that we have going on. So again, we, uh, if you still want to write in on the chat box on the web, if you have any questions, that would be wonderful. Um, for those of you who are calling in who may have questions um, and we aren't able to go uh, off of mute because there's interference, if you have questions, please feel free to send them to us afterwards and we can try to field them as necessary. Um, we appreciate uh, your flexibility with <laughs> the technology that we have. Um, so real quick, uh, for Save the Dates from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we have two annual events each year. Our mid-year planning meeting uh, is actually this coming Monday on September 17th here in Irvine, California. We're sold out, so for those of you um, who will be attending, we look forward to seeing you. For those of you who missed out, um, we hope that you'll join us at our meeting next year. We also wanted to let you know that we have a patient safety newsletter that is digital, and our October issue will focus on our actionable patient safety solution challenge number 16, which is person and family engagement. It'll be released the first week of October. So if you do not currently get those, um, you can sign up for free to receive that newsletter on our website by following our progress. We also wanted to let you know if you're in the Southern California area, we have our first annual Make the Save Soccer Tournament fundraiser. And so we will be having 12 teams um, compete to raise money to uh, improve awareness around medical errors and our goal of zero preventable deaths. It's October 6th, a Saturday at the Orange County Great Park. Registration is still open, um, so feel free to donate. If you're in the area, we'd love for you to come by and cheerlead. I am not athletic, so I will be on the sidelines not playing. Um, our next quarterly webinar is a special interest topic on metrics integrity. We have a, a special interest work group on the topic, and Robin Betts, who is at Kaiser Permanente Northern California, will be speaking um, on that topic on December 12th. And last but not least, um, our main event of the year is our World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit. It'll be held this year, January 18th and 19th, which is a Friday and Saturday at the Hyatt Regency Huntington Beach Resort and Spa in Huntington Beach, California. Registration is open, so we hope that we will see you all there. Um, it doesn't look like anyone else has chatted in, so with that, we will give you seven minutes back to your day. So we really appreciate your time. Again, Becca, Sarah, and Susan, thank you so much. And we look forward to meeting you all again on a webinar or at another event in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.